The bridge of Bellerophon was semi-dark, blending well with the quiet background hum of the spacecraft's various devices. It was just like the sci-fi movies Matthias had watched as a child. Don't you think it's a little strange? He asked. Khalid took a second to look at his friend. What? Well, you know, the feeling of where we are. Matthias shook his head thoughtfully. After all, we are now so farther away than humans have ever been before. That must have been the feeling of those who first climbed unconquered mountain peaks or landed on the moon. Caleb shrugged. I don't know. I guess you're right. He typed some commands on the terminal, and the flickering of numbers on the screen stopped. But I must admit that I'm not particularly thrilled. You're such a boring nerd, Khalid smiled. And you're an incredible romantic for a scientist and pilot of a research ship. You're supposed to be thinking about optimal trajectories and safe sectors of space around a star, and you're talking in lofty verbiage. He stopped talking and looked at the big screen, which showed a magnificent enlarged picture of the star Methuselah. Besides, you're wrong. Acute scientific curiosity is no less a respected emotion than discoverer's delight. There was nothing to say against that, so Matthias hummed uncertainly and stared at the star's image. There was nothing special about the way Methuselah looked. Just a regular star, spectral class G0. Not the most common, but not the rarest either. The uniqueness of the star was in something else. It was very old impossibly old, as its estimated age was nearly a billion years older than the age of the universe. Since the discovery of the star two and a half centuries ago, and the first astonishment when it was discovered that it had formed before the universe began, its age had been constantly refined. As science progressed and data accumulated, new estimates emerged, the essence of which was to eliminate the contradiction if possible. At one time, it seemed that scientists finally came to a consensus and fit the age of Methuselah within the error of calculations. However, when the 23rd century came, temporal physics began to develop actively, and everything returned to its original position. Methuselah was indeed a billion years older than the universe. Scientists shrugged their shoulders and postponed the problem until a new way to confirm or debunk this anomaly would appear. His head thoughtfully. The way came with the invention of the jump engine, which utilized topological warps of space. Even though Matthias was the pilot of the Bellerophon, he would have had trouble explaining exactly how the engine worked, because the mathematical theory behind it was insanely complex but he could control it and use the computer to calculate the route through the many nodes. The expedition to Methuselah was a record-breaking distance. Never before had humans traveled so far from their home, 190 light-years, almost three times farther than the farthest previous mission. But as soon as a new generation of computing technology and an advanced fusion reactor made it possible, the Earth Space Agency did not hesitate to send Bellerophon to Methuselah to test the accumulated hypotheses about the physics of time, for many of these hypotheses could lead to a critical breakthrough in science, followed by a breakthrough into the vastness of the galaxy. The entire future of mankind could depend on what Khaled and Matthias could, or could not, learn about this strange star. No planets, Khaled said. That was the original assumption, wasn't it? Yes, but now it's a confirmed fact. Quite unusual for a G-class star. But then again, Methuselah is an unusual star. What did your devices say? Matthias was one of the Earth's best temporal physicists. As a good mathematician, learning the jump ship navigator pilot profession wasn't hard for him. The times when spacecraft pilots came mostly from military pilots with the health and reactions of Olympic gods were long gone. Of course, good health never hurt, but to send someone without a scientific degree to the farthest and most expensive expedition in the history of mankind 
was an impermissible waste. Matthias had personally participated in developing most of the experimental devices designed to help people unlock the secrets of Methuselah. Khaled, the formal head of the expedition, was an astrophysicist and cosmologist. Matthias glanced at the display, which summarized data from the various instruments. Nothing so far. Although the time field strength was showing an unusual fluctuation, we'll have to get closer. Is it possible to use geosectors, or do we have to use ion thrust? The topology here is confusing, as it always is around stars, but there seem to be options. Matthias scrutinized the streams of numbers shaded by the surreal patterns shimmering on the other half of the screen, a visual representation of the topological folds of space. Of course, it's far from interstellar jumps, but we'll make it in a few hours. Estimated distance to Methuselah is six astronomical units, Khaled said. Roger that. Beginning fold calculation, geosector engines are warming up. Matthias's fingers ran over the keyboard. He was completely immersed in the calculations and did not even notice that the image of the star on the big screen was replaced by the logo of the space agency. Bellerophon was equipped with three types of engines. Jump topological warp engines designed to travel across the vast distances between stars, a kind of surfing through the topological folds of space. Geosector engines, which were a simplified and low-power version of jump engines, with which it was possible, with certain limitations, to travel in the vicinity of bodies with large mass, such as stars. And finally, ancient ion thrusters for near-planetary precision maneuvers. Ironically, the ion thrusters were the most cumbersome and clumsy, accounting for almost a third of Bellerophon's mass. The approach to a distance of six astronomical units from Methuselah took several hours, during which time Khaled and Matthias mainly prepared the equipment for research. Matthias constantly monitored the various parameters of space in real time, but noticed nothing out of the ordinary, only slight fluctuations, which was expected in the vicinity of the stars. The time field strength graph suddenly went into overdrive at the very last moment before the geosector engines shut down, producing several sharp peaks and deep dips. Matthias Barley had time to let out a loud cry of surprise before everything returned to normal. What happened? Khaled asked worriedly. Matthias shook his head. I don't know. The temporal stress sensors went crazy for a moment, but now it's as normal as if nothing had happened. Maybe there's a glitch in the system. It could be anything. Matthias pressed a few keys. I'll run a detailed diagnostic and see what it might be. Khaled reached for his terminal. I'm going to turn on the external view. Let's take a look at our old man in person, so to speak. It's time to know each other. He brought up a large screen with the images from the external surveillance cameras, a black abyss of space with a diamond scattering of stars headed by the brightest one, Methuselah, a picture familiar to any spacefarer, except that the constellations were different each time. But in the center of this picture, oh shit! A surprised exclamation burst from both scientists almost simultaneously, but they didn't even smile. Almost in the center of the screen, a man drifted in open space. I don't get it. Maybe the colonists from Proxima secretly organized their expedition, and something went wrong. Careful, don't push it. He doesn't care anymore, and if you smash into a body... Relax, Khaled, I've got it. This boat has perfect control. As for the colonists, you realize you can't hide an event like this, do you? It's not like snatching a sales tax. Besides, they don't have anywhere near the resources needed, material or scientific. That's true. But where did this poor bastard come from? I'll pick him up, return to the Bellerophon, and we'll find out, Matthias said. Approaching... The distance is 800 meters. I'll try to catch him with the power claw and pull him into the cargo airlock. 
Okay, just be careful. Did you notice his clothes? I've never seen anything like it. Matthias was piloting a small open space boat to the body drifting in the vacuum. The boat was intended for possible repairs. Not all parts of the 600-meter-long Bellerophon were accessible from inside. The clunky cylinder of the repair boat was designed to load additional tools and spare parts or to bring temporarily dismantled devices that needed to be repaired in the workshop to the repair dock. However, the boat was capable of getting away from the Bellerophon for a decent distance of several tens of kilometers, which was just enough for the rescue operation. The unknown man really looked strange. His body was wrapped in a tight-fitting black cloth, thin enough to show the details of his anatomy through it. At first glance, it looked like tight underwear, but the angular thickenings in various places suggested that it was some kind of jumpsuit that concealed the hardware underneath. The fabric covered the stranger's hands like gloves, but on the feet, it changed into some sort of light boots. An oblong oval helmet with a black mirror-like surface concealed the stranger's head, so it was impossible to see his face. Whatever the garment was, it was undoubtedly too light to protect its wearer from the cold of the vacuum and cosmic radiation. When Matthias brings the body aboard the Bellerophon, they will try to find out who the man is and how he had found his sad end in a place where they had assumed, not so long ago, that no man had ever set foot. The operation to capture the body was a success. As soon as the outer gate of the landing dock closed and the atmospheric pressure equalized with the ships, Khaled ran up to the boat, rolling a medical gurney from the infirmary in front of him. Matthias took off his spacesuit, and they opened the cargo bay to load the body onto the gurney. It's strange, Matthias said, when they had finally accomplished this task. He looked at the body, then at his friend. I just realized it now. He's been in a vacuum for God knows how long. Shouldn't he be frozen, hard as wood? Indeed, the stranger looked nothing like a man who died in outer space. His body was slack and soft, making trying to move him more problematic and contradictory to try to explain that fact. You're right, Khaled said. It didn't occur to me in the rush either, but it is very strange indeed. How did he end up in outer space like that? While you were catching him, I thoroughly scanned all the space around here. No damaged spacecraft, no debris, nothing at all. It's like somebody just threw him out of an airlock and flew away. He looked at the body on the gurney and reached for the stranger's mirrored helmet. Matthias wanted to stop him, but was too late. A moment before Khaled could touch the shiny surface, an elusive ripple ran across it. Then it turned from mirror-like to matte, split into two halves, and disappeared into two dots on the stranger's temples. The stunned Earthmen stared at the calm face with closed eyes. The man looked about thirty or forty years old, based on Earth's idea of age. Straight nose, clean-shaven face, short-cropped blonde hair, dark skin, slightly slanted eyes. A perfectly ordinary appearance, typical of billions of people. The only thing that caught the eye was the metallic glint of implants in the stranger's temples. It was those devices where the helmet had been retracted. Cybernetic implants have been a common thing on Earth for a long time. They were used both to compensate for any injuries or physical disabilities and to acquire additional capabilities, for example, to expand vision to the infrared and ultraviolet parts of the spectrum. The stranger's implants, however, attracted attention by how harmonious they looked. There was a distinct feeling that they penetrated deep under his skull, right into his brain, and secondly, that they were a completely natural part of his body, as if he had been born with them already. Matthias shook his head, pushing the foolish thought away, and then something else, equally impossible, caught his eye. The stranger's chest was rising and falling evenly. He was alive. Honestly, I don't know what to do, Khaled said looking at the infirmary viewscreen. He's alive, 
but he's not regaining consciousness, and we can't determine what's wrong with him or wake him up. Given his implants, I can't use a CT, X-ray, or neutron scanner. Among other duties, Khaled served as an expedition medic. Well, no use for the CT makes sense, Matthias replied. But what was wrong with the X-ray and the neutron scanner? Khaled shrugged. We don't know how they might affect the implants. We don't even know his level of cyborgization. From the look of the ones on his temples, his whole body could be infused with technology. For example, these thickenings on his spacesuit. He pointed to the bulges on the stranger's chest, thighs, and forearms. What are they? Devices built into the spacesuit or external parts of the implants. We just don't know. So you're sure it's a spacesuit after all? Matthias thoughtfully twirled an empty coffee mug in his hands. It looks a little flimsy and unreliable. Otherwise, I don't see how he could survive in outer space, Khaled said. By the way, I tried to pull back the collar to at least get a look at the underside, but I couldn't. It's like it's stuck to his skin. I even had the unbelievable notion that that the whole so-called spacesuit is one big implant? Matthias picked up on that. You know, an hour ago, I would have discarded it as nonsense. But now I don't know what to think. If only he could tell us something. There are no inscriptions, factory markings, stuff like that on the suit? Khaled shook his head. Nothing. And I didn't risk trying to take a sample. I did one little experiment. Watch. He pressed a few keys, and the image from the infirmary surveillance camera changed to a video. Now, Khaled was standing next to the stranger, still on his back on the infirmary bunk, holding a pair of tweezers with a piece of absorbent cotton. The old-fashioned method, Khaled said with a slight smile. The smelling salts. I figured since we can't stick needles in him or stuff him into our sophisticated devices, why not try something that's worked for centuries? Well, I realize it didn't work. But since you're showing me this footage, does that mean something unusual happened? Khaled nodded at the screen. Just watch it. Matthias watched Khaled on the screen as he carefully brought a cotton swab dipped in ammonia to the stranger's face. However, Something unexpected happened before the ancient remedy was close enough for the pungent odor to penetrate his nostrils. The stranger remained immobile, but liquid darkness suddenly spurted out of his implants and instantly spread around his head, hiding his face beneath an opaque mirrored surface. On the screen, Khaled recoiled in surprise, dropping the tweezers. For a few seconds, the stranger lay in full space attire. Then the strange helmet melted again and retracted back into the implants. Wow! Matthias looked at Khaled dumbfounded. Now I understand why you hesitate to poke our friend with sharp objects. Exactly, Khaled said. Actually, if you remember that ammonia is, strictly speaking, a poison, everything makes sense. You know what it looks like? A reflex reaction. Matthias answered without thinking. In fact, that's how anyone would react. Put something stinky to our faces and we'll pinch our noses or turn away. Except he's unconscious. Matthias pointed to the screen. So the implant's protective protocols are working, Khaled said. Or the spacesuits, or the whole complex. There's no telling how it might react to an attempt to damage something, even with the best intentions. It might even perceive the magnetic field of a CT or X-rays as a threat. Well, that's a situation, Matthias said. But he's obviously human. He needs to not only breathe, but also eat and drink. Let's say that his supersuit can somehow cope with the waste products, but I don't see any containers where there could be water. What do we do with him if he doesn't regain consciousness? We can't give him anything intravenously. Khaled shook his head. I have no idea. We don't know how long he's been in space. But you can't tell from his face that he's dehydrated. His skin's fine, his eyes aren't sunken, his breathing's normal. 
It's like he's just sleeping. I tried taking his pulse, but it was not palpable through this fabric. So, other than waiting, there's nothing we can do. What the hell? The light flickered a few times, then dropped in intensity and went into the stroboscope mode. Maybe the contacts are malfunctioning, Matthias suggested. We don't use this room much. Could there have been a minor fault in the assembly that went unnoticed? No, Khaled shook his head and pointed at the screen. The image was rippling, but it was clear that there was a problem with the lighting in the infirmary too. Matthias jumped up quickly and looked out into the corridor. Damn, he exclaimed, and rushed into the control room. There was no more light in the corridor, only the dim red self-contained emergency lighting. Caled ran after him, so he didn't see how. At the last moment before the screen finally shut down, the stranger floated above the recliner without regaining consciousness. The flickering lights and instruments of the infirmary reflected in the mirrored surface of his helmet. Running into the bridge, Matthias leaned over the power control panel. Fortunately, the bridge equipment was still on, but a quick glance at the main readouts gave Matthias a chill. The Bellerophon was powered by three quark fusion reactors at once. Normally, one reactor carried the main load, while the other two operated at minimum load, supplementing and duplicating the main one. The main load reactors were rotating every few days although all three reactors worked at 80% simultaneously if necessary, for example during the start pumping jump engines. Now, if the readings were to be believed, one reactor was completely shut down, and there was no contact at all with the other as if it did not exist. No data on the reactor's status, no power, nothing at all. As for the third, shit shit. Matthias began typing commands into the terminal with desperate speed. The third reactor seemed about to start or had already started an uncontrolled reaction. The magnetic traps holding the quark gluon plasma were working at absolute maximum capacity. If they failed, the entire Bellerophon would turn into a cloud of superheated gas. Meanwhile, Khaled had activated all the space monitoring devices. Not all of them responded but the cameras pointed toward the star were working. Something very strange is happening to the star. Khaled exclaimed, It's like it's shrouded in a haze, and it's clearly reddening and grown in size. To hell with it, Matthias said. Let me freeze this reactor, and then we'll figure it out. Meanwhile, please test all communication circuits with the reactor B. Right now, it looks like it just broke off and flew away. Copy that. Khaled typed a few commands that started a detailed test of the second reactor's control system. Data flashed on the screen. I don't understand, Khaled said in surprise. The system says that the reactor has reached the end of its life and has been shut down and that the control sensors have failed due to wear and tear. That's total crap. Matthias hit the enter button and finally unbent. Ooh oh looks like I got it. The readings are returning to normal. Another one is already frozen, though I'll be damned if I knew why and how. Now what were you saying about the end of the lifespan? It's crazy. Those reactors are designed to last 110 years, and the sensors have a design life of 50 years, plus a safety margin. How can that be? Khaled threw up his hands. Based on the test results, that's what it looks like. Until we get more data, we'll have to rely on them. Matthias shook his head. We don't know what's going on down there. It's all very, very strange. Three super reliable reactors, and all three of them failing at the same time, each in their own way. Plus, I've restored power, but half the equipment is still down, and there's no communication with the compartments. It is theoretically possible to start Reactor A, but it will take several. Are you listening to me or not? Khaled stared fixedly at one of the displays, ignoring Matthias's words. Khaled. 
The astrophysicist flinched, looked at Matthias, and then, with a keystroke, brought up the image on the large screen. Whereas the star had looked like a tiny bright circle of yellow on the external view cameras before, now it sprawled in a red foggy boil over nearly a quarter of the screen. There was no doubt that it was Methuselah, as the pattern of constellations around it remained the same. However, it was not the instantaneous transformation of the star into a red giant that threw both scientists into a stupor. Into the view slowly floated, overshadowing the stars, a massive ship of completely unfamiliar design. Engineers had long ago adopted radical functionalism when building ships that were not supposed to land on planets. No streamlined contours, no excessive aesthetics. Most spaceships were huge cylinders, bristling with antennas and sensors, and the largest, such as the Bellerophon, were almost shapeless construction of many modules. The designers of the ship on the screen were clearly of a different mind. Given its size, it was obviously not intended for planetary landings, and yet its sleek contours looked more like the atmospheric fighters of the past than the bulky, heavy designs of Earth's open space ships. The ship's shape was reminiscent of the stingrays of Earth, the ancient inhabitants of the oceans, yet it was nearly twice the size of Bellerophon. In addition, several huge translucent blisters were visible on the ship's hull, starting with the largest on the central body and ending with many smaller ones, symmetrically scattered on the fins. Scientists, mesmerized, looked at the incredible ship, not even paying attention to the strangely changed star. So far, not even a hint of intelligent life was found, although several planets with a biosphere have been discovered. And here it was, the first contact. Matthias suddenly remembered that, strictly speaking, it might not be the first. Khalid, he called out, something has occurred to me. Don't you think our friend in the infirmary might have something to do with this? Khaled hesitated to answer. Occam's razor tells me you must be right, he said at last. But if that's the case, who are they? I mean, the guy you fished out of space is clearly human, but that ship... He didn't finish, but Matthias understood what Khaled was trying to say. The alien ship was clearly far beyond the capabilities of modern humanity, as was the spacesuit of the rescued stranger. Is it possible that the alien race could be indistinguishable from the humans? At this point, Occam's razor jabbed at the concrete lack of information. Matthias suddenly saw the alarms flashing on the temporal equipment control panel. He brought up a summary of the readings on the display screen. Shit! Khaled, we have a problem. According to the data, the temporal fields near the star have gone crazy. The sensors are showing values that are not even accounted for by theory. Either all the instruments have gone down at once, or... Wait, I have an idea. Here. He typed a few commands. Khaled looked at him. What do you have in mind? Wait a moment. Matthias answered and pressed enter. There. Oh my God, I can't believe it. What's going on in there? Khaled exclaimed impatiently. Matthias looked at the small screen on his console, where some bright patterns were shimmering. I visualized the temporal fields in the vicinity of the star, he said at last. You won't believe... He looked at the alien ship frozen in the center of the view screen, shadowed by the purple Methuselah. I don't believe it myself. Look. And he pressed another key. The visualization of the temporal field superimposed itself on the image. Methuselah changed from a red, misty ball into a tangle of spiral vorticas, iridescent at the edges and coal black in the middle, twisting and turning into one another. Before Khaled's eyes, two of these vortices suddenly straightened like springs and turned into long prominences that shot out into space, gradually losing brightness. One of them streaked straight toward the screen, toward Bellerophon, and Khaled involuntarily recoiled, 
but the prominence did not reach the research vessel. From several points on the alien ship's hull, fans of iridescent flame spewed out and unfolded into giant, glowing canvases that merged into one huge shield, screen, a sail. For some reason, that comparison came to Khaled's mind. Perhaps it was because the ghostly prominence had caused the ethereal canvas to billow like a sail in the wind. Khaled even expected the ship to move but the manta remained motionless, only shrouded in a light, shimmering glow. Another vortex unfolded on the Methuselah, and another rainbow jet streaked toward the two ships. Khaled suddenly realized that everything he saw was just a visualization, that all these prominences and sails were temporal fields of incredible concentration and power. Judging by Matthias, who was entirely hypnotized by the spectacle, even he, the world's leading expert in temporal physics, did not understand what was happening and how such a thing was possible. Apparently, the alien ship noticed a new prominence because the position of the sail changed slightly to intercept it as well. The sail sagged even more. Khaled, who had completely lost his sense of reality, thought, it's going to burst. However, the sail did not burst. Instead, it let some of the rainbow glow pass through it. As it faded and dissipated, this part was no longer a directed jet, but a scattered wave cloud that reached Bellerophon. Khaled felt his head spinning rapidly and his heart throbbing with a sharp pain. The lights in the control room flickered, and the lights, sensors, and screens began to go out one by one. As he was losing consciousness, he saw Matthias slump to the floor. Khaled's legs buckled as well. At the last moment before he blacked out, he thought he saw several black silhouettes and mirrored helmets standing in the control room, but he had no time to realize it. Now we know why Methuselah seems older than the universe, Matthias said and grimaced. His head was still sore, but the tonic cocktail had done its job, and he felt much better. Khaled, who had recovered first, looked sympathetically at his comrade. When you passed out and fell, you hit your head hard against the base of the console. That was the penultimate thing I saw before I passed out myself. The last thing I saw was them. So, I wasn't imagining it? Matthias shook his head gently and sighed in relief when it didn't respond in pain. No, you weren't imagining it. The security camera picked them up before it went out too. I think they were here to pick up their comrade. Whom, by the way, we rescued, Caleb said, and they almost killed us in return. Matthias shook his head again, more confidently. Not them, Methuselah. They were just trying to protect us. Speaking of the weird stars, so what's with Methuselah? Matthias was silent for a moment, gathering his strength. Methuselah is not a star, and it's not older than our universe. Rather, it is only partially connected to it, a kind of time reactor. When you're close to it, you can accidentally see, or even partially visit, its distant future. That's why we saw it as a red giant. What do you mean? Well, at our plane, so to speak, it is indeed a star. But at the same time, it is also the temporal version of our fusion reactors. Khaled shook his head in amazement. A time reactor? Wait. Are you saying that Methuselah is an artificially created time machine? Matthias shrugged. I don't know. It's just a guess for now. It could be a natural phenomenon, like the natural uranium reactors that once existed on Earth. And space sailors have learned to use them for practical purposes. That's a nice name. The analogy isn't direct, of course, Matthias clarified. They don't actually use Methuselah's temporal emissions as a direct drive. Somehow, they convert them into energy, which they use to travel through space-time coordinates. You mean they're time-traveling? 
Well, not literally, as the ancient sci-fi writers imagined, Matthias smiled. You know that the relationship between space and time is much more complicated. So there are no time paradoxes and other funky stuff. But accidents are possible. Probably because of some such mistake. The one we picked up ended up in outer space. Fell overboard during a dangerous maneuver, so to speak. So we did rescue him after all, Khaled said. And then his friends came back for him. I don't think his spacesuit could have kept him alive for long in a vacuum, despite all the advanced technology. So our primitive trough came up near Methuselah, very conveniently. By the way, their reaction to our actions also partly influenced the fact that I dubbed them space sailors. Rescuing those distressed at sea has always been the mainstay of seafaring and the most honored and respected tradition. I think they appreciated that we lingered in the vicinity of Methuselah to rescue their colleague, even though it was deadly for us. They probably didn't know we had no idea of the danger. Well, if they hadn't gotten us home, we wouldn't have had a chance, Khalid said. You can't run the jump engines on 40% power from one barely breathing reactor. But how did they do it? I didn't have time to tell you. They left something behind. A little message. I found it in the memory of my terminal. Matthias pressed a key, and a familiar image appeared on the big screen. The crimson disk of Methuselah, the iridescent sparks of the temporal currents, a ship of space sailors, and the clumsy bulk of the Bellerophon taken from the side, and more stingray ships, appearing as if from nowhere, dozens of them. Surrounding the helpless Bellerophon from all sides, Stingray ships released their power sails, which, like a cocoon, enveloped the ship. Then, the entire fleet suddenly disappeared without warning, as if it was never there. Only Methuselah and the starry sky remained. After a moment, the image flashed and was replaced by a new one, showing only the Bellerophon, but against a background of familiar constellations that everyone on Earth Seas in the sky. Matthias stopped the recording. That's it. While you and I were unconscious, they towed us to the outskirts of the solar system. If they're so omnipotent, why don't they repair our reactors, for example? Khalid asked. Do you know how to make fire by friction? Or make flint knives? Oh, you think it's like that? Khaled grinned unhappily. Well... It's kind of humiliating. You're probably right, though. But who are they anyway? The result of convergent evolution? Aliens from the parallel universe? I don't know. Matthias was silent for a moment. No, I don't believe in convergent evolution. It can't be that accurate. A parallel universe sounds more plausible. But maybe they are us from a future where the very concepts of future, past, and time have radically changed their meaning. Hopefully, we'll be able to figure it out when we return. A soft beep notified them that the geosector engines were beginning to decelerate. Bellerophon, which the space sailing ships had left on the far reaches of the solar system in the Oort cloud, was approaching well-developed and human-populated areas. Most of the equipment on the ship including communications, was still out. But the view cameras were fine. Khaled turned them on and put the image on the screen. The two scientists watched in silence for a while. As I recall, Khaled said at last, navigation wasn't perfect in the days of the sailing fleet. Until the sextant and accurate chronographs were invented, yes, Matthias said. It seems that our friends... Haven't invented its space version yet, said Khaled. I wonder how many centuries, or millennia, they missed. His words hung in the air. The survey system was set up so that when the ship arrived in the solar system, it automatically focused on critical points. The orbital shipyards of the Uranus system, the colonies on Ganymede, Mars, and of course Earth. There were no more orbital shipyards, along with the satellites and the rings. 
in their place was one giant, artificial ring around Uranus, a titanic metal structure flashing with billions of lights. Instead of a few inhabited domes, Ganymede was entirely surrounded by a bubble of some kind of force field, beneath which the planet was lushing with green and blue, teeming with life. The same was true of Mars, which had lost its stark brick-red color. Only the Earth retained its usual appearance, but the moon was built up so tightly that it looked like an artificial satellite. Looks like we're going to have to get used to being Neanderthals, said Khalid. What were you saying about flint knives? We already have a boat made of hides and whalebone. <laughs>